From the Cronkite Studios in downtown Phoenix, this is Cronkite News. Good evening, and welcome to this special edition of Cronkite News on Arizona PBS. I'm Megan Espor. Tonight, we take a look back at the top stories from our government and justice team, from one mayor's personal story concerning opioid overdose to a hike to honor a fallen firefighter. The opioid epidemic is affecting all types of people, wealthy, homeless, old, and young. Last year, the mayor of Safford, Arizona, lost his 25-year-old son to an opioid overdose. Now, he and his wife are using their heartbreak to make a difference. My name is Jason Kautz, and I'm the mayor of City of Safford. I am the associate pastor here at the river. Jason and Maria Kautz are leaders in a town of less than 10,000 people. One week after graduation, we got married. And then four months later, I got pregnant with Josiah. Josiah was their oldest son. He grew up playing sports, making straight A's, always with an army of friends. He seemed to live like the perfect life. All, everyone loved him. He just didn't have a whole lot of struggles. He went to Mesa Community College, but it wasn't long before his perfect life started to shatter. And the next thing that we knew, he was there about six months and we got a call from a friend and they said, Josiah's 90 pounds. He's not going to college and he's just stuck in his apartment. And we're like, what? I was just chasing after saving the community, saving the world, if you may. And yet I failed on my own home front. Josiah was hooked on heroin. Jason and Maria brought him back to Safford right away, starting a series of detoxes, treatments, and near death experiences over the next few years. We wanted our kid to get clean. We wanted him to get off of the drug. We wanted him to have a normal life because we thought we were, we were normal. We were normal. The normalcy finally came after Josiah went through his last rehab in Phoenix, then moved to Paris following the love of his life. He spent a year learning the language in the city so his first foreign job could be a tour guide. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this is Josiah. He was so driven. Things were looking up for Josiah, but the cravings returned, and before long, his marriage was over. The 25-year-old returned to Safford, started working again, and saved all his money to go on a cross-country road trip with friends. After a month on the road... And Josiah came back to Safford, spent the night. The next day, he slept all day. It was January 22nd, 2018. They had family time that night. The last night, they'd have that chance. Josiah didn't show up for work again the next day, so when Jason got home, Maria asked him to go check on Josiah. He worried, slowly making his way up the stairs. Josiah's room was locked, but Jason pried his way in. This is forever burned and etched into my mind and in my memory. And there he was, off the side of the bed, face like this, kind of crunched over. And I run, I, I just start screaming. I touch him, I make sure I, that, that there's no pulse in the body, it's as cold as ice. You're screaming, he's dead. No, Josiah, he's dead. And I just started screaming, and I didn't know, I don't know what to do. I'm just like running around in circles. And I'm screaming, I'm coming down, and I'm, I'm yelling and, and screaming, and Maria's all, what? And she's like panicked herself, and then she runs up there, and she's just holding. I love her lifeless son. Lifeless after using a $5 bump of heroin laced with fentanyl. And when they showed it to me, I said, you've got to be kidding me. That is not what killed my son. The life ending dose came from a high school acquaintance who warned Josiah over text message how strong it was. The young man had told Josiah I'd only do 75% of it because it's fire. And he put little fires, 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 like five little fires across there. The Couts say Josiah's death is helping the Safford community push through the opioid epidemic. I think because of the stigma was always that it's not my family. My family has to appear to be perfect. My family has to, you know, we're a small community and it's a religious community. And so religion tends to make people want to appear to be perfect instead of real. And that's what's making an impact on people who go to church with Jason and Maria. Before Jason and Maria, I was overwhelmed and I felt so helpless. Like I have a lot of family members who are lost in addiction and I had no idea how to help them until Jason and Maria came alongside me and I could ask them questions. Even while helping others, there's still internal guilt Jason copes with every day. I would say I'm sorry. 
I was so mean to him. I was so, I was, I was the boss. I was the dad. I, there was times we, we, I, I butted heads at work and I would yell and I would scream and I'd cuss at him. Jason's tough love turning softer as the pain and guilt motivate the Couts family to carry Josiah's legacy. I see a book and it's a large book and 37 pages of the book were written up by Josiah himself, but his book is not gonna stop turning as long as I'm on this earth. It's gonna still be written out. It wasn't for nothing that my son was born. It wasn't for nothing that what my son went through and what we've gone through in our lives. I will finish his book if, it, if it's the last thing I do. Jason and Maria started a nonprofit after Josiah's death and they plan to open Josiah House, which would be the first 24 hour rehab center for people struggling with substance abuse in Safford. U.S. Republican Senator Martha McSally and the Department of Defense have reached an agreement to quickly form a task force to combat sexual assaults in the military. Cronkite News reporter Bayon Wang has been following the announcement and says the task force already has a list of short-term plans. Bayon, how will this initiative assist sexual assault victims in the military? Yeah, their focus right now is to improve military responses when an allegation of sexual assault has been made. This includes the way they investigate sexual assaults and the way they prosecute them. For Martha McSally, this is a personal matter as much as it is a professional one. Earlier this month at a Senate Armed Services subcommittee, McSally said she was raped by a superior officer during her service in the Air Force. Nearly two weeks after this revelation, McSally wrote a letter to the Acting Sec Secretary of Defense, Patrick Shanahan, calling for a task force to combat sexual assault in the military. Shanahan responded saying, quote, DOD leadership is committed to fixing this and I look forward to working with Senator McSally and our task force to find solutions that will eliminate the issue from our ranks. So this has been a, um, uh, a journey that I didn't expect to be on, uh, just to be candid with you all. Uh, not one that I would have chosen, uh, not one that I had even planned for uh, if we had talked a month ago as to what we're uh, focusing on in my office. But uh, sometimes, you know, you're asked to step up and lead on issues that are maybe personally painful for you, but you have a unique perspective to lead on. McSally says she is hoping to meet with a group of task force leaders next week to discuss what other initiatives could help stop sexual assault in the military. Live in the broadcast center, Bayon Wang, Cronkite News. This afternoon, the House Elections Committee heard a bill that would move Arizona's primary election date up by about two weeks. Cronkite News reporter Bryce Newberry joins us live with the impact this would have for the state. Bryce? Senate Bill 1154 would move Arizona's primary election date during a general election year to the first Tuesday in August. The bill just passed the House Elections Committee this afternoon, 6 to 4. Late this afternoon, a representative from the Arizona Secretary of State's office told the House Elections Committee that the bill is missing key elements in order to actually work in Arizona. And the League of Arizona Cities and Towns testified the bill would cause some Arizona cities to violate their charters. During a change to the primary election date, starting in 2020, the next time we'll vote for president. From an election administration perspective, uh, the more time we have between those two elections, the better. You never know what race is going to take a long time to count in the primary or what race is going to be challenged in court in the primary. But from the voters' perspective, a change like this could cause confusion. The biggest issue for voters is going to be familiarizing themselves with the new calendar and then to not be uh, surprised when literature starts hitting their door earlier, when official publications start hitting their door earlier, when the early ballot hits the door earlier. The date change would cause a domino effect, moving up all other deadlines leading up to the primary. The sacrifice being asked of voters is to adjust their behavior uh, just a little bit. That adjustment could come with a side effect. We really want to make sure that voters um, aren't suppressed, you know, in, in a, as an inadvertent effect of this by creating confusion with, you know, voters across our state. But voters could get a different positive side effect when choosing their next president. When it comes to, you know, getting in more candidates to come and speak to Arizona voters, um, potentially moving back the primary election could help with that. 
Bannerman told us the Democratic Party would even be open to considering an earlier date like May for the election. The last time the primary date changed was in 2009 when it moved one week earlier. Senate Bill 1154 has a trailer bill, Senate Bill 1289, which would make the corrections brought up by the Secretary of State's office this afternoon. The bill still has to be approved by the full House before it moves on to the governor's office. Live in the studio, Bryce Newberry, Cronkite News. Schools are bracing for a bill making its way through the Senate. That would allow loaded guns on campus parking lots. Yeah, I attended the hearings to see what people are saying about this issue. Take a look. I was affected three times by gun violence. Having a loaded gun on campus isn't going to make me feel safe. Several brought their stories and concerns about House Bill 2693. This is a dangerous bill, should never have been considered. The bill would allow loaded guns to be stored in vehicles on school grounds. In Arizona, guns are allowed in public school parking lots, but are required to be unloaded, a law several protesters don't want changed. I have four children, young children, who still have to go through the school system and it terrifies me. I mean, we're already dealing with the issues of lockdowns and uh, just living with the everyday fear of gun violence in schools. So why would we make guns more accessible on our campuses? It's just, it makes no sense. It's not what Arizonans want. But some senators, like Republican Sonny Borelli, disagreed. These are great talking points and good conversation to have. But I would hope that somebody, a law-abiding citizen that is armed, can kill that dirt bag that's trying to harm people. Republican Senator Eddie Farnsworth backed the bill and said it may actually make things safer. The simple task of loading and unloading a gun is not the issue. It's not the capacity or the ability to load or unload a gun. It's the fact that whenever you handle, whether it's a knife, whether it's a gun, whether you drive a car, if you do that, your chances of something accidentally happening now exist. The bill passed in a four to three vote in the judiciary, but protesters said they're not done yet. We will continue to lobby our legislators and call them and show up at their office to let them know that this is not what parents want, this is not what teachers want, this is not what students want. In Phoenix, Bayon Wang, Cronkite News. People from across the country came together to march a mile for each state vote needed to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. Reporter Gabriella Becerra spoke with the marchers who walked through rain and shine for the cause. Despite the weather and the blisters, marchers finished the final 10-mile stretch of their three-day march. They began today at Senator Kirsten Cinema's office this morning and ended at the Arizona State Capitol, where supporters rallied with legislators. Hey, hey, we the this cause is important. Our mothers deserve this, our sisters deserve this, our daughters deserve this, we deserve this, and we're going to do it. Equal Rights Amendment supporters marched 38 miles in three days. Their goal is for Arizona to ratify the Equal Rights Amendment. The Equal Rights Amendment was proposed and sent to the states for ratification in 1972. Arizona is one of 13 states that has not ratified the amendment. Make no mistake, bad men doing everything in their power to stop the ratification of the Equal Rights Amendment. But that crossroads at which we find ourselves will not be navigated by the men. It will ultimately be navigated by the women. Kim Mundus initiated the idea of the march. The idea was in part inspired by women who marched from Newark, New Jersey, all the way to Washington, D.C., to march on D.C., to demand the right to vote. Mundus also kept the group on pace. It's been tough. It's been tiring. We're sore. Marchers like Catherine Roxlow walked all 38 miles over the past three days. Roxlow says the pain. My feet hurt so bad. Is worth it. This is nothing. I can take a couple blisters. I mean, for everything everyone's done before us, this is a piece of cake. It's a, it's a pleasure and an honor to be able to do this. The marchers finished their three-day march by sitting in the galleries of the House and Senate. In the Broadcast Center, Gabriella Becerra, Cronkite News. State lawmakers are taking up the issue of teen suicide. A new bill would require school staff to undergo suicide prevention training. Cronkite News reporter Tavia Madison was at the Capitol for the latest hearing on Senate Bill 1468. If you woke up tomorrow and heard that three people you knew had died by suicide, you'd be concerned. 
about three lives per day in the valley are lost due to suicide. This is a number Representative Alma Hernandez is all too familiar with. You know, my best friend committed suicide seven years ago. Dorothy was just 22 years old when she died by suicide. Hernandez says coping with that loss wouldn't have been possible without her school's resources. We had a great support team there at the University of Arizona who reached out to me and said, how can we help you? Those are the things we need to ensure that every child in our schools have that available to them. Lawmakers want to ensure students have those resources with Senate Bill 1468. The bill would require suicide prevention training for all staff in schools working with students from grades 6 to 12. Teachers spend a great deal of time watching our kids, having eyes on our kids. We want to make sure that they have the knowledge of what to watch for. Teachers across the valley currently have access to the training, but it's not mandatory. That's why lawmakers say it's time for change. Deaths by suicide are about twice as many as homicides. So think of that. Murders are a horrible situation, and there are about twice as many deaths by suicide. And, and yet, suicide is preventable. And to prevent those deaths, Epstein says there are three essential elements. Prevention, intervention, and postvention. The bill passed the Education Committee yesterday with a vote of 13 to 0, and lawmakers are hopeful for more progress. Treatment works, recovery happens. If we can help kids, we can stop it. In Phoenix, Tavia Madison, Cronkite News. If the bill passes, Arizona would join states like Texas and Georgia in becoming the 29th state to mandate suicide prevention training. This morning, Valley firefighters hiked the Echo Canyon Trail at Camelback Mountain, and each step was to honor the life of Captain Paramedic Kyle Brayer, who was shot and killed last year in Scottsdale. Cronkite News reporter Amani Stevens takes us to the trail. Kyle Brayer served for 10 years with the Tempe Fire Medical Rescue Department until he was killed on February 4, 2018 after a road rage incident. Kyle was the best in all of us. Um, just the way he conducted his life, how much, how much he served others through, through the Marines, through, through the fire department as a firefighter, then an engineer, then a captain. He just always uh, served his community. A year later, Valley firefighters honored the life of Brayer and each step they took on the Echo Canyon Trail. Kyle used to do this mountain all the time. He was known to do this uh, two, three times a week. I'm not even halfway there yet on this trail. And so far I've walked more than 2,000 steps. And you can see just how steep it is. A friend of Brayer say he would often hike this trail with sandbags. Sometimes he would come up with a sandbag and with his, uh, one of his good friends that works in Phoenix Fire. And they would be able to do this within under 30 minutes. And one time, Kenneth Roman, who graduated with Brayer from the Phoenix Fire Academy, joined Brayer on his favorite trail. It's Brayer, because I thought he ran this thing. And I ran all the way up here, and he comes walking up. I'm walking up. Like, oh, oh. He goes, what are you doing? I was like, I thought you ran this thing. He goes, no, I walked this. <laughs> Just thought you would have been proud to see everybody here. And friends say it's still hard to be without him. No, just that uh, I miss him. A lot. Roman says he plans to do this hike not just once a year, but throughout the year to honor his friend and colleague. His saying was, uh, pay the price. And that's what you do, you know, not as a firefighter, but as a human being. So in remember him, I will always do this hike. In Phoenix, Imani Stevens, Cronkite News. Volunteers revamped a garden that helps feed a local community. Reporter Nicole Hernandez shows us what they did and why it was so important. It takes patience. One month. One month for these plants to grow just that big and even longer until they sprout food. I'm here because I love the, the garden, I love the plants. Margarita Jimenez doesn't mind the wait. I feel relaxed and I feel the connection with the earth. But today her community garden is being uprooted. Today was a big day to get these garden beds ready for the spring and summer harvest. After about a year, the dirt has compacted down and lost a lot of nutrients. So today is all about taking out these plants to add dirt to about here. This is their home. This, this is their home and it's vitally important to make it, to improve it as best they can for their family. 
Tens of thousands of families in Maricopa County struggle to put food on the table. This is one of many other things that the community has been able to use to come around. Helping end hunger one vegetable at a time. A lot of the individuals come from uh, from countries in which they did grow their own food. They know the taste of freshness. For them, this garden is a small taste of home. I don't know why, but it's delicious when you put with your, your, uh, um, your hands, it's, it's great. In Phoenix, Nicole Hernandez, Cronkite News. This garden has been up and running since last year. But the new improvements will help it to grow more produce for the more than 20 families that participate. Many tent companies are choosing to create and test groundbreaking technology right here in Arizona, which led us to be ranked number 16 in Wallet Hub's annual report for the most innovative states. Reporter Gabriela Becerra went to the third annual Arizona Tech Innovation Summit and tells us about some of the new startups right here in our own backyard. Startups like Birds Electric Scooters and Waymo self-driving cars are at the forefront of Arizona's, self, of Arizona's tech innovation conversations. But new legislation was the main focus at the summit today. This will be the state that leads in this category. Governor Doug Ducey signed House Bill 2673 at the Tech Summit this morning. The Prop Tech Sandbox Bill it's the law of the land. The bill will create a property technology sandbox, a space for companies using tech to sell real estate. Prop tech companies will have a welcoming place to develop and test products and services, and consumers will be protected as they benefit. Representative Jeff Winnegar sponsored the bill and says the property sandbox will be able to deploy technology on property in a very rapid way. There's a regulatory burden dealing with property technology. Uh, or regulatory ambiguity, it is going to allow them to apply for this sandbox and have a, an answer in 90 days uh, whether or not they're allowed. Senator Kirsten Cinema also talked about introducing new legislation in the coming weeks. I'll reintroduce our bill, the HALOS Act, bipartisan legislation that I led in the U.S. House to make it easier for angel investors to find startups. CEO of Envision AZ, the organizer of this summit, says increasing innovation will improve our state. Bringing technology opportunities and businesses to Arizona will help us diversify our economy in a very, very positive way. Ducey says he encourages the tech community to keep pushing forward in Arizona. Look where we are today versus where we were four years ago. Imagine where we can be next year and four years from now. Also announced today, Lucid Motors will be building a brand new luxury electric vehicle here in Casa Grande. The company says it will bring new jobs. In the control room, Gabriela Becerra, Cronkite News. For the very first time, the Maricopa County Point in Time count included not only homeless individuals, but their pets as well. Sammy Gieber spoke to the Maricopa County Association of Governments as to why they made the change. I'm sure they'll like it. You are welcome. Take care. Good to see you. Cheryl King Wade makes it her full time responsibility in her retirement to help homeless individuals <laughs> and their pets. Now we are going down to the um, CAS area, Central Arizona Shelter Services. We just see a little dog named Sammy who hasn't been feeling well. Oh boy. Me and Sammy, we owe her our life. Um, I had him since he was just a fuzz ball. Um, he was that, that big. Um, he saved my life. Um, me and him been homeless. We've been all the way around with each other. We, we can't do it without each other. Wade met Dina Figueroa when she needed help with her dog. Figueroa couldn't get into a shelter without the proper vaccinations for Sammy, so Wade stepped in. Sammy went ahead to get his shots and we'll still be homeless. So I really did appreciate everything you're doing for us. You are very welcome. And Figueroa is not the only one who has issues finding shelter with a pet. Most homeless shelters do not allow pets. So it's really a challenge for people who are trying to seek shelter and, you know, their pets aren't welcome. 
Vanessa Cornwall and the pet rescue she works for, Lost Our Home, helps people by taking their pet for a while or offering up food and other supplies. And especially in Arizona, having a pet with you on the street can be tough. That's a big challenge because obviously, you know, if it's too hot for people to be outside, it's definitely too hot for your pets. She wanted to find out more about what these owners needed, so she participated in the first Maricopa County point in time homeless count that surveyed pets as well as their owners. Come here. That's when she found Rody. <laughs> and just how malnutritioned he looks. And, you know, that was really a result of the valley fever. Rody is doing a whole lot better. But before, his owner was struggling to get the resources she needed to take care of him. I give the food from my plate to my dog before I eat. There's nights I will go hungry just to let, make sure my dogs eat. And that struggle, well, that's why Maricopa County Point in Time Homeless Count added survey questions this year. We've learned that there could be potential challenges to folks obtaining housing and or supportive services. And we've heard about the, the increasing number of pets on the street experiencing homelessness with their humans. So we wanted to start asking that question. Everyone deserves someone. And for a lot of people, that someone is their Dog. Wade will take dogs to the vet, get them fixed, and provide as many resources as she can from the back of her van. You're the best. Thank you. You know, I'm an ugly crier. We've been over this. But she can't get to everyone, and the new change to the survey hopes to shed some light on the issues that these pet owners face. You want this? In Phoenix, Sammy this? Gebers, Cronkite News. Preliminary numbers from the survey showed more than 100 pets were homeless with their owners. Shantae Smith says the survey isn't meant as a population estimate, but more of a snapshot of the resources needed for these individuals. That's it for Cronkite News tonight. Thank you for joining us. For top stories anytime, go to cronkitenews.azpbs.org.